Please sit. Hello, very good morning to you. Nice to be with you. Now, at Pimble, we are connoisseurs, I think, of a good sermon, don't you? <laughs> we know all of the moves. We know the parts. There's the introduction, there's the body, there's the conclusion. And we're expecting a joke or a hook at the introduction. And then we get into the meat and potatoes. That's the body of the sermon. That's where we go a bit deeper into the Bible. And then just when we're starting to lose interest, we get a heartwarming story. Uh, you know, something that will lead us to the conclusion, which will tie it all to get the job done in 35 minutes or less. Well, in Matthew's Gospel, uh, we have been following the greatest sermon of all time, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And when we get to chapter 7, verse 13, we have arrived at the conclusion. And as many preachers do, at the conclusion, Jesus calls his hearers to respond to what they have heard. What's different in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, of course, is that it seems that there's a lot more at stake here than a typical church sermon. How we respond has very real consequences. Let me explain. The first part of Jesus' conclusion brings together three warnings, each with very contrasting results. Then the second part of Jesus' conclusion describes the outcome of the choices. Our choice to either put Jesus' words into practice or to ignore them. And so as sermons go, Jesus' sermon concludes in a fairly straightforward manner. We make a choice and we receive the consequences of that choice. So let's go back and look at the three warnings with which Jesus begins his conclusion. The first is a call to choose the narrow path the unpopular way verse 13 enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it as hearers of jesus words we face a choice we stand as it were at crossroads and we must choose one way or the other. We can choose to go through the narrow door leading onto a difficult road, but it leads to life. Or we could take the other alternative that Jesus always presents two alternatives. There's a wide gate with a broad road. It leads to destruction. And to be clear, this is a choice about how we respond to Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Living the kingdom life now is not easy. Jesus' way is much more difficult than going with the flow in the other direction, following the way of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. That's part of the comparison that Jesus is making here. And so for us too... Jesus' ways are foreign to our culture in our world. Jesus is saying we should be careful to choose his way, his way of living as is described in this Sermon on the Mount, even though it's going to be challenging. We know that. The second of Jesus' warnings is to beware of false prophets. And so reading from verse 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognise them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you'll recognise them. So on this narrow path of living the life of the kingdom of God, there are going to be 
people who will speak to us and try to lead us astray. They pretend to speak from God, but they're frauds. They are not God's prophets, but they are false prophets. So don't listen to them, says Jesus. Don't follow them. Initially, they look harmless, like a little white lamb frolicking on the mountainside. But in reality, they are dangerous, like a wolf, and they're looking for their next meal. Now, if they do initially look harmless, how are we supposed to discern which ones are the false prophets? How do we know they are handling God's word correctly? How are we supposed to know whether they are bearing good fruit or not? Well, the first kind of fruit that we should look for is godliness. Is the personal life of the preacher or teacher consistent with the ways of Jesus? Is there a trail of hurt and broken relationships behind that person? Are they actually growing more like Jesus? Are they mature? Second kind of fruit that we should look for is the effect of the preacher's teaching. Are the ones following this person being built up to become more like Jesus? Is their ministry making disciples of Jesus Christ or are they making disciples of themselves? Pretty important questions to ask of any Christian leader. Jesus warns us that on this narrow path there will be false preachers who, like wolves, will be actively deceiving for their own benefit. And by way of contrast, Jesus says, his followers choose truth. They hear his word, they see his life, they see what he does and the impact he has on people and they discern here is one who truly speaks from God. Jesus' third warning for life on this narrow road is that some may be self-deceived. They think of themselves as living for Jesus Christ but in fact, they are really in it for their own gain. So let's read from verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You see, it seems that there are some who claim to follow Christ. They call him Lord or Master or Sir. But they're really only seeking their own fame, their own immediate gratification or even their own gain. Instead of the false prophet who would deceive us, this warning is about our own self-deception. We are the ones who need to be aware of our own motives, our own inner life and faith. Jesus seems to be saying here it's somehow possible for our relationship with God to be corrupted, watered down and ultimately rendered empty by our own choice. I think the fundamental issue here is an authentic relationship with God. Jesus' words here are chilling. Depart from me, I never knew you. That's a relational dynamic, isn't it? I never knew you. At the heart of the life of discipleship is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Does he really know you? Does he know the real you? Have you given yourself to him, your time, your obedience, your goals, your ambitions? You see, ultimately, we are asked about our embrace of Jesus as Lord. We might call him Lord, Lord. But what matters is our living with him as Lord 
in charge of every area of our life. We might do many spectacular things in the name of Jesus, preaching and performing miracles and casting out demons, but those things are not the substance of our relationship with God. You know, when the lights are out, when no one else is at home, no one else is around, do you know Jesus? Would he say that he knows you? That's what matters. You know, in our lives, we have many accessories. Uh, these are nice additions, they're helpful extras. You know, they kind of make things sweet, but, but they're not the core. Accessories are like matching handbags and scarves. They're like, um, you know, the radio and the lambswool seat covers in your car. They're like the bell on a bicycle. Our relationship with God can never be an accessory to an otherwise crowded life. If you sense that God is being squeezed into a small space in your otherwise crowded diary, then Jesus' words here are really worth thinking about. Saying no to some nice accessories in life might just be the key to truly being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your priority is clear. He is your core. He is the fixed and solid heart of our lives. Now, it's a tough call to make, isn't it? But we make these kind of decisions because, according to Jesus, there's actually a lot at stake here. You might have noticed, if we scan back over the text so far, where does the wide gate and the, 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 the broad road lead? Well, it's a superhighway to destruction. And many are going that way. Thinking about the false prophets who bear bad fruit, they are cut down and thrown into the fire. And the deluded miracle workers and preachers, they are sent away from God and they're called evildoers. Whatever destruction and fire and the faraway place that Jesus sends the evildoer to, hell is a, is, a, is a conversation we'll have another day. But it just sounds pretty bad. Let's just say that. And so we would do well to listen carefully to Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. Paying attention to Jesus' words here leads us actually to peaceful security. No matter what comes our way, not paying attention, well, the outcome of the choices sounds pretty bad to me. So to the outcomes of our choices. This is where Jesus really wraps up the sermon. We're in verses 24 through 27. Let's look at them again. You know them well. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So we've got the, the wise guy and the foolish guy. And you've got to ask, why are there always two guys in the story? Can't we just have a, a parable where both guys get it right? We need the contrast. We need to see both options. Because let's face it, some people are going to build their houses on sand. So Jesus says the wise builder hears his words, puts them into practice, and he builds his house on the rock. All the challenges of life are thrown at it, but the house stands firm. Why? Because it's got a solid foundation. But the foolish builder... And this guy hears the words of Jesus and he says, yeah, I'll just wing it. He builds his house on the sand. 
Same storm, but this time the house crash, crashes down like a game of Jenga. Have you ever played Jenga? So you build those little, you know, you build a tower of, of little rods and you have to pull out one at a time. We used to play this a lot when we were kids, and, and the sound of the, the tower falling down is it's you know, it's a big crash, and we all have fun and then we play again. You know, this this metaphor of a house. I think works very powerfully, powerfully for us in our place at our time, don't you think? For the homeowner in Sydney, nothing grabs our attention like a story of interest rates. Are they going up or down? There's a new development going up next door. There's a, there's a new trend in the housing market. For many in our city, owning your own home is an achievement of a lifetime. Now, if you're of a certain age, and you bought your first home a long time ago, you might feel this more through the experience of your own children who cannot afford to buy a house and live in a house near to you. For those who haven't paid off their homes yet, statistics tell us that between a quarter and a half of every dollar you earn is spent on paying off the loan. It's all being poured into a great big pile of bricks and concrete and tiles and timber. And then, of course, you know, there's, for all of us, there's a personal investment, an emotional investment that we put into making our homes comfortable. And we make them attractive and we, we style our houses, don't we? And we renovate our kitchens. And we put artwork up on the wall and there's a vase with some nice flowers in it just as you come in the front door. We sort of stamp our personality on our houses in some lovely way. And so imagine then the sudden destruction of everything you have invested into your house. Unexpectedly, without warning, the storm comes. The earthquake rumbles. The elements rage and everything collapses under you. All the bricks and the concrete that once seemed so secure are shown to be as flimsy as a Jenga tower. And that's the scenario Jesus would keep us from. He says, everyone, oh, that gets worse, doesn't it? Everyone who hears these words of mine, that is Jesus' teaching here on the Sermon on the Mount, and puts them into practice, is like the man who built his house on the rock. So at the end of Jesus' sermon, we see that security and peace, even in the trials of life, they are found in living the kingdom life right now. There are real consequences for how we respond to Jesus' sermon. Do you remember at the start of this whole series of talks, we put Andy Bell into a time machine and we sent him off into the future kingdom of heaven. And he experienced life there under the perfect rule of Jesus. The life lived in the way that God intends it to be. And he was changed by that experience. The, the right way of life, where everything is under God's hand and done his way, turns out to be the best of all possible circumstances. Notice, do you notice, as we've read through this Sermon on the Mount, how much of Jesus' teaching here is about our relationships with one another? Love, forgiveness, integrity, respect, trust. This is the reality that we all aspire to, that we long for. This kingdom life is so good, said Andy Bell when he got out of the time machine again. We should all start living this way now. This way of living, Jesus' way of living, is the righteousness that he saves us for. This is the doing of righteousness. Where we see ourselves truly in the mirror of God's word, and instead of walking away and forgetting about it all and we actually choose to live our life differently. Did you notice that James, in our first reading today, said that we are blessed in the doing of God's word? 
In other words, the goodness of living the kingdom life, it's not all stored up in the future. It's actually good for us now. Actually living according to Jesus' teaching brings a kind of peaceful security and contentment in life now. We are blessed in the doing of righteousness. So here's the thing. Storms are going to come. That's life. It's full of storms. There's, there's financial storms, there's health storms, there's relational storms. If you're lucky, you might even get a weather storm thrown in just for good measure. The question Jesus asks us is what is our house built on? Living the life of the kingdom now, following Jesus' words in this Sermon on the Mount, actually brings blessing and it brings security no matter what happens. I want to give you just a, a little moment now to, and, and if you'll permit me, you close your eyes now and we're actually going to draw near to God prayerfully. And I want to give you just a little bit of time to think about how you'd like to respond to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Prayerfully think about what is it that you might do that would actually be putting God's word into practice? What will be different for you now? What will you do in response to what you've heard Our Lord Jesus, we thank you for the words of life. We thank you that you have made so plain to us what it is like to live your way in your kingdom. We thank you for the great mercy that you've shown us in saving us by grace. Now that we are saved, we pray that you would help us by your spirit to actually live your kingdom life now and for eternity. We ask this in your mighty name. Amen.